Grammy Award winner, Arturo Ferro. Uh, and, uh, to, and with his family member, two sons, and uh, a bass uh, musician to come to share their love, joy, and fun with us, the music, of course. Uh, he, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words about him. He recently got the uh, a Grammy Award for 2015 Best Latin Jazz Album CD. The name of that is The Offense of the Drums. So go get it, you know, after the concert. And uh, Arturo Overo is uh, our former CCC faculty member, and now he's also an associate professor at the Eastern College in the Human. So let's put our hands together. Welcome.
That was a piece that I wrote uh, called Mass Incarceration Blues. You'll have to excuse me, but uh, I get a little political every now and then. And uh, that's Zachary William O'Farrell on the drums. Adam O'Farrell on the trumpet. Carlo De Rosa O'Farrell on the bass. No, I wish, I wish, I wish. I've been trying to cut costs, man. Yeah, he said, okay. <laughs> anyway, Carlo De Rosa on the bass. Um, we're gonna continue. That was Latin jazz, by the way. If it was Latin jazz at all, it was because we are all of Latino stock. Doesn't it sound like Latin jazz, right? It sounded like straight ahead, but there you go. It's a duality. Um, <laughs> we're gonna play some uh, more Latin -y sounding music. You guys okay? Yeah. All right, just making sure. <laughs> we're gonna play something Brazilian for you by the great Livio Almeida. It's called Action and Reaction.
is uh, Action and Reaction by Livio Almeida. I think we'll play uh, a piece by a great pianist, a friend of mine, and uh, one of the founders of Fort Apache, Larry Willis. This is called To Wisdom the Prize.
some really strange music now, since we feel licensed to do so. Um, this is a piece that is uh, firmly embedded in Turkish music. And uh, there's a direct connection between Turkey and Cuba, geographically, spiritually, uh, culturally, and aesthetically. Um, you may not recognize it as such, but uh, we think you'll hear this as Latin jazz as well.
grandfather used to say in the old country. Now that's quality listening. Okay. All right. Sorry, you guys are so serious. Today. What is this? A jazz concert? <laughs> Come on, man. Feel free to have fun. Um, if you can. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. Are you enjoying yourselves? Yeah. Good, good. That's important to me. Um, sorry. We're going to play a little bit of uh, a gentleman who I think is one of the great, great composers in Latin jazz. A gentleman who uh, taught me just about everything I know. His name is Papu Vasquez, and this is his piece entitled Not Now, Right Now.
We got one more for you, and I think we're gonna have some questions. Um, once again, Adam O'Farrell on the trumpet. <laughs> Jack O'Farrell on the drums. Carlos De Rosa on the bass. My name is Arturo O'Farrell. We're gonna play a piece. I think we're gonna close with an Adam composition. Uh, that we enjoy playing very much, just because it's really kind of loony. A little bit like uh, Adam. Adam and Zach are interesting products. They are, uh, my wife is African American, Native American, and Jewish, and I'm Mexican, Cuban, German, Irish. Uh, so there's a lot of mixed up stuff in our family. Can't really, uh, and that's the way they think, these two. They're kind of not here, not there, but everywhere. And so Adam wrote this piece called Industrialistic, and it says at the top, in the left-hand upper corner, under the description for how to play it, it says, New Orleans hip-hop reggaeton capitalist social democracy Zen Buddhist Baptist. <laughs> so, I don't know what to say. The whole thing is frightening. But we'll do the best we can. This is called Industrialistic. You know what, I just realized I'm looking at a B-flat part. <laughs> just give me one second, ladies and gentlemen. That's fine, I love this piece.
Jack O'Farrell. Jack O'Farrell. Carlo Rosa. So we want to take a minute and just answer questions. I realize it's weird because it's, uh, you know, you're an audience and we are performers, and I, I don't believe that nonsense ever. You know, I try really diligently to destroy that line. You didn't help by sitting all the way in the back, by the way, but it's okay. Um, hello? You guys there? Okay, good, because we love you, man. We want you to be a part of us, right? I know it's a little strange, but we want to answer your questions. Any questions, you can ask anything except how much I make a year, that's it. That's the only question that's verboten. Otherwise than that, please ask questions. Can we have a little bit of house lights? Just a tiny bit? Yeah. You improvise, right? Do you think in chords or do you think in scales? I don't think in chords or scales. I really don't. I think in melodies. Um, I don't even really understand harmony. Um, I do understand. I mean, I was trained. But for me, harmony is this fluid, flexible, Thing. It's like a rubber band, it stretches around. And you'll find that as the 20th century progresses, <laughs> harmony really does stretch around in all kinds of shapes. I think more important than harmony is, is melody. Anybody else? Are you still cognizant of like the changes that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, I feel like if you just outline every chord change, it kind of, uh, it kind of, not very redundant, you know. Like chord changes are just one element of a much bigger picture, and you want to think of things to kind of uh, complement or or maybe shape around the chord changes rather than like just kind of being in them all the time. Another way to look at it is to 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 see the chord changes not so much as fixed points in space but as general uh, graphic colors that are very, you know what I'm saying? Like you can see a C7 as four notes, or you can see it as a shape around which many things exist. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, you'd also say like the chord changes. Think of it more, instead of just like getting each chord, think of the, cha like the harmony really shaping the, the flow and progression of piece or two in your body. I like to think of it as a video game. I like to think of it as Mario jumping from cloud to cloud. And each chord is a cloud. And the cloud is not necessarily this fixed point in space. It's a rather large thing. And you have to kind of, you know what I mean? It's not just one location. A chord has many locations and many locations around those locations. So if you look at it as a, just a platform as opposed to five notes fixed in space forever invaluable by the way if you play a wrong note there's no such thing as a wrong note just an inopportune moment right so <laughs> questions more questions i love questions please anybody yes no one more two more there's one okay i did my mentor actually was a history teacher. <laughs> My mentor uh, was a history teacher that I took undergraduate American history with. And he's the guy that asked me why I was a musician and ruined my life. Because he said to me, why are you a musician? And I said, because I like to play music. And he said, to what end? To what purpose? And he got me connected with the idea that we don't do things in a vacuum. We do things to share, to teach, to connect to our community. Um, he showed me much about possibility, and uh, how it, notes in and of themselves are pretty boring things. But connected to human lives, um, they become alive. Uh, you mentioned politics, um, but, but I want to ask you specific questions. I, I noticed that jazz musicians tend to be the most um, open-minded and uh, sort of honest people out there. You, what jazz musicians do you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. It's got to be connected to the music. How do you feel about that? You think I answer that? Jazz is, jazz, uh, the, the community of jazz musicians has, has, by and large, but not completely, 
grown to be a little on the conservative and uh, closed-minded side in the last couple of decades, I think. And it's actually gotten to the point where jazz is so insecure about the future of its own existence that it's taboo to say anything controversial even about jazz itself or, or jazz musicians, let alone to start trying to throw in politics and stuff that's going on in the world into the music. People, if a lot of times when you try and do something like that, people will say, hey man, shut up, you just start playing the music. And it's like, no, this, is, this music is, jazz is music of oppression and, and music of the oppressed. And, and, and actually in a lot of ways, uh, for the most part, I think most jazz musicians have kind of lost sight of that. There are a few exceptions. There I mean, you gotta remember that jazz, jazz was born, born in a bordello, baby. Uh, oppressed people suffering uh, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. Uh, it doesn't do well in the elite concert halls. Certainly it doesn't do well as a, as a, as a conservative uh, conversational model for America centrism. And I don't say that because I don't love my country, by the way. I love my country, I love my neighborhood, I love my block. But I think the great thing about being American is questioning and demanding better. And I think sometimes jazz, it, you know, Zach put it really well, jazz is so afraid for its survival because it's dwindling numbers, baby. Dwindling numbers, man. Less and less people care about this music. Mostly students, jazz students at that. And, uh, and just, we, we've lost our relevance. I haven't, but a lot of us have lost our relevance. And I think that has a lot to do why we're so quiet. You know, <coughs> yesterday I stood up and spoke at a rally on uh, 14th Street Union Square. Spoke at a rally of thousands against uh, the uh, kind of violence that's taking place against minority youth in this nation by policemen. But I love cops, I love NYPD, I love SFPD, LAPD, but uh, you gotta have a conscience, you have to have a voice. You see it all the time on the news, terrible things are happening, you know. And as a community, as people, as people of white, black, green, red, gay, straight, as people of many persuasions, we have got to unite. We've got to unite. More questions? Uh, when did Adam start playing? And when did Zach start playing? How did you push them? 20 minutes ago. I started when I was eight. I started when I was eight also. Um, we never really felt pressure to have to play music. It was just, we were constantly around it, so. Yeah, I wanted to do it. Yeah. More questions? Over there. Yes, one. Uh, can you talk a little bit, uh, we have a lot of students that are in some introductory music courses here. Can you just explain the difference between rhythmically and what you guys are doing musically when it comes to playing something that's straight ahead? Like sure. Tune and something that's based in cloud eight. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Excellent question. Um, there's a, kind of two schools of thought. I mean, that's really sim simplifying the equation. But most musicians talk about two kinds of jazz, straight ahead jazz and Latin jazz. Um, I don't know why those divisions came to be, but they did come to be. And uh, straight ahead jazz is based more around a very simple pulse and a rhythm that kind of drives in even measurements, right? So that uh, usually a straight ahead jazz piece can begin with a, a bass line that's just kind of, if you can see his fingers, you can see Carlos' fingers kind of looking like they're walking, right? And they're walking, you can see that that's what it's called. It's called the walking bass, it goes like this. But you can already tell that the pulse is very even just going, ba, ba, ba. And then we usually we add um, a cymbal ride, a spangalang, it sounds like this. So that's, that's kind of called straight ahead, and it's jazz because we do play blues, gospel, and fused African music with improvisation thrown in. Kind of sounds like this.
that, that, that kind of defines straight ahead jazz. And that straight ahead kind of pulse, even measuredness can take place in many tempos, uh, slow, fast, and different senses of it. It's simple though, because sometimes straight ahead jazz also refers to way shorter, refers to anything that isn't based in Latin or African percussion or Afrofolkloricism. Um, within straight ahead jazz, there's also some modern interpretations, but what they really mean is straight or Latin. And Latin, of course, is really different. Latin is based on syncopations that are not even. It's based on a clave pattern. The clave pattern is something that you clap or hear that sounds like this. One, ba, 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 one, ba, ba. You hear that throughout this pattern, right? So you, if you can already tell, it's not this pulse, right? It's got a very specifically different way of counting it. And the bass line is not walking, it's tumbao. Then there's a very specific conga pattern. And on top of that, usually another percussion is placed across the back. about it, the concept is still groove. The concept is still, right? There's still that kind of even swing to it. And then, of course, we also improvise and have our own. We can play blues as well. just based on that even meter kind of pulse. And Latin jazz and the other kinds of Afro-folkloric jazz is based on a, a, a kind of more Afro-folkloric pattern. Other questions? When I was growing up, what did I play? Yeah. I was a Bud Powell freak. I loved Bud Powell. More than, more than oxygen. I love Bud Powell and the Levens more than life itself. Um, that's all I played. I played straight ahead jazz. And I didn't really start playing Latin jazz until I was in my 30s because it was the music of my parents. And uh, I thought it was simple music. And I thought it was hebaro music, music from uh, the countryside. And what I found out is it's as sophisticated and as difficult to play accurately and authentically with great groove as anything uh, in jazz or classical. I'm a classically trained pianist, by the way. My degrees are in classical piano. Um, but to me, it's all the same. Me music is a big, big, big art, man. From Brahms to Lupe Fiasco, there's a line. You just got to find it. Any more questions? I'm happy to take them, by the way. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned something about uh, the relations between uh, Turkey and uh, Cuba. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious, so that's just kind of interesting. Would you like elaborate on that? There's actually no real, I just made that up. I was trying to say <laughs> um, There's actually no physical connection between, between Turkey and Cuba. They're in different parts of the world. Um, but I think spiritual connections between people who are folkloric, uh, the Turkish music is so beautiful, man. Turkish culture is so amazing. Turkey stands at the center of so many unbelievable civilizations and eras and times. Turkey, Turkey has left its uh, imprint on all of us. And uh, the beauty of folkloric uh, uh, music and what Turkey has is, is incredible. Uh, so I was joking, but I think that it, it, at the root of all of us is this kind of folkloric life that we have on Earth. Not in the institutions, not in the elite corporations, not in the airlines or in the Coca-Cola head boardrooms. But at this level, where we live, where you and I live, we share something. It's folklore, it's life, it's love, it's death, it's giving birth, it's, you know, we love our kids, we love our older folks. We're people, man. That's, you can't get more folklore than that. And every Turkish person and every Cuban person knows that. Another question? That's a really good question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question. I thought for a long time that you could do both. I don't think so anymore, and I'll tell you why. To be able to play the tumbo de Couperin takes a lot of technique, takes a lot of touch, takes a lot of years of building uh, clarity and articulation. Um, and it is also the kind of thing that you do as a classical pianist, you encapsulate a piece of music in your mind and as you dole it out, as you perform it, you add an element of now to it in real time. It's very different. The same technique is applicable to jazz as it is to classical music. You must have articulation, you must have touch, you must have clarity. The difference being is that you have nothing to dole out. There's no piece of music floating in your mind that you're unraveling. It's all completely improvised. And so what I try to do and I try to, you, what, so in other words, when you're playing a piece of classical music, your fingers know the notes. That's a really different feeling than not knowing the notes, <laughs> right? So it's not a physical reality that classical and jazz are different. They're the same. It's a mind reality. They're very different in that sense. In that sense, you have to really have a very different approach to playing music. You have to make up notes as you go along, and that affects the way you articulate. That affects the way you, you want to try and have as calm a hand as possible, as you would with a Ravel or a Brahms or a Beethoven piece. You want to have as little excess as possible. But it's hard to do that when you are in the tense moment of making up notes, because that makes you uptight. <laughs> Does that help? OK, anybody else? Good question. Really good question. Great. Anybody else questions? Um, if it wasn't but Powell, then who else would you study? Um, I really loved Chick Corea when I was growing up. Uh, I just really loved, I think Chick Corea is one of the great pianists of our time. It just technically, I can't imagine a more complete musician. I'm not crazy about his choices, but I think uh, I, as a pianist, I, I don't think I've ever heard a more complete musician. And when I was growing up, I was completely bedazzled uh, by his skill. Anybody else? I, um, I just came from the practice room, and it seems like I missed the concert. Is that the case? No, we can play one more for you. We want to hear one more? Yeah. Okay, we'll play one more for you. Thank you so much for having us here today. I spent uh, several years at Queensboro as faculty member. I just remember this place and the students as extraordinary. An extraordinary chapter in my life. Uh, just really an amazing, amazing institution. And I'm so honored and, and delighted to be able to be here today. Thank you for having us.